All right, um, I think we're going to start. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for joining in for this conference. Um, I'm Varadhi Noria, one of the Infectious Disease Critical Care Fellows, and um, the topic for today that we will discuss is hemodynamic monitoring and interpretation of arterial catheterization. Um, thank you to Dr. Grafton for guiding me to this presentation. So what I hope to cover in this presentation is the objective um, of the objectives of hemodynamic monitoring along with its components um, and most importantly discussing the practical applications of A-lines and PA catheters. So the focus is going to be on A-lines, um, basic setup, interpretation of waveforms and then PA catheters. Um, Dr. Marino quotes um, Albert Einstein in his IQ book and I think it's very apt to what we see in hemodynamic monitoring. He says not everything, Albert Einstein, not in Dr. Marino, says that not everything that counts can be counted and not everything that can be counted counts. So we need to keep this in mind when we are interpreting uh, the data that we see. So what is the goal of hemodynamic monitoring eventually? Um, it, it's, it's simple. At the end of the day, what we want is to guide our resuscitative efforts to ensure tissue oxygenation. So we manipulate the circulatory system at the end to ensure oxygen delivery. I always like going back to the basics just to understand the concepts better. Um, this is a diagram I'm, I'm sure we're all very, very well aware of with about of a circulatory system and the wealth of information we can get with various diagnostic tests. So oxygenated blood flows from the LA through the mitral valve to the LV and is ejected into the aorta during systole, which form, you know, forms a stroke volume or cardiac output. Um, our output is divided in, it gets distributed to various organs. The majority of it goes into the brain, kidneys, and the gastrointestinal tract, almost 20%. Um, coronary circulation re receives about three to 5% and skin receives about Skin and skeletal muscles to receive about 20% as well. But 70% of our blood lies in the venous side, and venous capacitance is highly variable and acts as a buffer for the change in volume status in patients. So an arterial line would provide us data on this side of our circulatory system. It could give us information on our systolic pressures, our MAPs, ABGs, um, and SpO2. A PA catheter could add to this information and give us CVPs, pulmonary artery pressure, pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, and the dynamics of all these, this data together can help us determine what's going on. Um, another key concept, what causes multi-organ dysfunction in shock? So, multi-organ dysfunction is a clinical expression of dysoxia, which is a condition where the energy yield of nutrient metabolism is limited by the availability of oxygen. Dysoxia can result either from inadequate oxygen delivery or defect in the mitochondrial oxygen utilization. Inadequate oxygen delivery is tissue hypoxia, and the defect in mitochondrial oxygen utilization is cytopathic hypoxia. Now, what determines oxygen delivery then? It's the rate of oxygen transport from the heart to the systemic capillaries and systemic circulation. It's determined by our cardiac output and the oxygen arterial content of the blood, which in turn can be de derived by this equation of cardiac output times 1.34 times hemoglobin times the saturation, oxygen saturation of blood. And 10 is um, to convert from milliliter per deciliter to milliliter per liter. 
and cardiac output is something we can determine with its heart rate times stroke volume, but it, the fixed method is oxygen consumption divided by arterial oxygen of the content, arterial oxygen content and uh, minus the venous oxygen content. So why am I talking about this? Because I just want us to keep this in mind about uh, when we are trying to derive numbers, just to keep our end goal in mind about what we're trying to achieve with these numbers. Um, another note before we proceed, the hemodynamic patterns that we obtain can identify a problem that we could potentially fix but they do not provide the information about what's happening at the tissue oxygenation level. Um, when we add oxygen consumption to the equation, that actually gives us more information about what's happening at the tissue level. Um, this illustration here shows that when the rate of oxygen uptake into the tissue is unable to match our metabolic rate, the glucose metabolism is actually diverted to formation of lactate. And that's where oxygen consumption actually plays, understanding oxygen consumption plays a big role. So coming to arterial line, just the basics, why do we place it? Um, it gives us continuous <coughs> blood pressure monitoring, which is important in our ICU patients. We place it for frequent ABGs, when they have major fluid shifts in surgeries uh, for invasive monitoring and for diagnostic angiography. Um, so I always start with history. Um, I think it's fun. So 1773 was the Hales experiment. Dr. Stephen, well, I don't know if he was doctor at that time, but Stephen Hales um, demonstrated that blood rose to a height of eight feet, three inches in a glass tube, which he placed in the artery of a horse. And he was, the horse kept dying because it was a carotid artery. And obviously this was not, in, you know, it could not be done and reproduced in humans. Um, this was modified and in 1825, we had uh, the mercury manometer, which was, um, which, dis which was discovered by Jean Leonard Marie. I can't pronounce his last name, but it's Puawazi. It's a Puawazil experiment. Um, and he discovered that it's the arteries that push the blood in and not the veins. It was a big discovery and both devices required inserting a tube into the artery. So in a way, these two were our very first arterial lines. Then in 1847, um, Carl Ludwig modi modified this manometer and turned it to a chymograph, which could actually, the ability of this graph was to show um, rhythmic changes in blood flow. This was, uh, original sphygmo graph in 1854, um, but the, it was further refined and by 1880, we actually had our first sphygmo manometer. Um, however, non-invasive blood pressure monitoring can be unreliable in the ICU setting. I know there has been recent data published that you could use non-invasive um, monitoring in ICU patients, but for continuous blood pressure monitoring, monitoring invasive um, A lines are obviously standard of care. Um, this was Dr. Hales, and this is now. So, does anybody know who this is? It's thanks to him that we can safely place arterial lines in the ICU and do a lot of things. No, it's Dr. Sven Seldinger. So, he's the one who created the <laughs> building your technique. Okay, so talking about this setup, I think this is probably very basic for everybody, but um, arterial line is in the, we have a radial arc line over here. Um, we have a stiff low compliance pressure tubing attached to the arterial line, a transducer which converts mechanical energy to electrical signal, signal. Um, an electric cable that connects to the monitor, and we have a pressurized bag of normal saline. So the, the pressure transducer converts the patient's arterial blood pressure oscillations into electrical waveforms that is readable on a monitoring device. Um, the catheter and its connecting tubing need to be stiff or made of stiff material so as to not absorb the pressure waves because that could actually affect the waveforms that we see 
on the monitor. Um, and the normal catheter transduction system uh, allows for a parallel saline flow, which is like a slow flush, but it's pressurized up to 200 millimeter mercury. And it, this infusion does not affect our arterial reading. It just basically keeps our arterial lines patent and trying to avoid thrombus formation. So this is um, the arterial waveform that we are all um, familiar with. Um, there are the components to this waveform that I think are important to go through. It can be separated into a systolic and a diastolic component with a diacrotic notch in between. The anacrotic limb marks the initial upstroke, which occurs as the blood is rapidly ejected from the ventricle to the aorta through the aortic valve. The systolic peak is its highest point. The diacrotic notch is the closure of aortic valve. And the diacrotic limb is the fall of the arterial blood pressure as the blood moves into the peripheral vessel. So this, um, the ECG represents the electric con electrical contraction of the heart and the arterial waveform represents the mechanical contraction. The systolic upstroke of an arterial waveform in a peripheral artery may not appear for about 120 to 200 milliseconds after the R wave on the EKG, reflecting the time interval from the electrical initiation through the expulsion of the blood by ventricle until it reaches the catheter and transducer. So this delay is something we routinely see on our, our monitors. Mean arterial pressure. So one of the really good things about A-lines is this continuous um, number that we can get from it. Um, it's a time average pressure in the major artery and it's the principal driving force for systemic blood flow. And that's why it's so important for us to uh, keep map goals in mind. It's measured electronically as the area under the arterial pressure wave divided by the duration of cardiac cycle. And this is for when we have A-lines, the monitor does it for us itself. So manually, the, the equation for MAP is one-third systolic blood pressure and two-third diastolic blood pressure. So the diastolic blood pressure makes um, a, a big component of our MAP. So what does this systolic upstroke represent? Um, it, the slope of the upstroke reflects the change in pressure over time. So if the slope is steeper, the greater the pressure over time, that means theoretically your contractile force is stronger. And if it's a shallower slope, it's a slower pressure waveform and it's a weaker contractile force. However, there's been um, studies done to see if the stroke upstroke, systolic upstroke can be used to interpret ventricular contractility and it's a very um, controversial uh, area. I, we typically don't use it because there's so much more that defines um, ventricle contraction that it's uh, difficult to interpret the systolic upstroke just by on the basis of ventricle contractility. So this concept was important to understand the systolic amplification. So the, these are the different arterial waveforms that we can see in different, um, going from the aorta down to the dorsalis artery. The contour of the waveform changes as, as we move away from the proximal aorta. As the pressure wave moves towards the periphery, the systolic pressure gradually increases and the systolic portion of the waveform narrows. We can have as much as a 20 millimeter mercury difference between the proximal aorta and the radial and femoral arteries. And I'm gonna to come to what, what, this, what this comes from. But the important thing to remember is the increase in peak systolic pressure is offset by the narrowing of the systolic pressure wave. So our map actually remains the same despite the changes in systolic pressure. And why does that happen? It happens because of a reflected wave phenomena. So the pressure waves that are, reflected wave is the pressure wave that are reflected back from the vascular bifurcations and the narrowed blood vessels. So they move faster when the arteries are stiffer and when they reach the arterial, and they reach the arterial pressure waveform and form this notch, 
which causes a rise in the systolic peak and adds to the systolic pressure. So in a way, the stiffer the arteries, the more the reflective wave, the higher is your systolic peak. So one condition, can we think of a condition where we could have really powerful reflected waves? What do you say? Like hypertension, right? Hypertension, peripheral vascular disease, we can see powerful reflected waves due to poorly compliant vessels and um, the systolic uh, peak. Another important concept, the diastolic <laughs> runoff. Um, and I have to say, I walked around MICU and uh, CICU yesterday trying to get a good diastolic runoff picture. I, I don't think I got one, but <laughs> um, a drop in pressure which occurs after the aortic valve is closed. So what does this mean? So after L left ventricular systole has ceased, the elastic recoil of large artery still maintains enough pressure early in diastole to push the blood forward. So this actually ref reflects that pressure that the generated from the elastic recoil of the arteries. And that's why it's a slow waveform. It's not as st steep as the systolic. Now, a scenario to con consider. If our, let's say our stroke volume is fixed and the diastolic runoff shows like a sharp decrease, that means, um, well, if I say what it means, that means you'll know what I'm getting at. <laughs> Let's say there's a sharp decrease. What could it imply? Uh, and I'm put this waveform as a hint. So what could make the blood move extremely faster in diastole? It'll be when there's no resistance. So when there's, when there's no resistance, that means there's dilatation. You have an upstroke and the diastole, instead of having that elastic recoil and pressure, the, the, way, the blood is moving really fast. So it causes, it's basically decrease in vascular resistance. So in sepsis, you can have a sharp decrease in your diastolic runoff. And this could also be seen in vasodilator therapies that we use. Uh, and this is what I was trying to get pictures of <laughs> in the IC yesterday, but our, the physiologies of our patients were too complex for a simple sepsis waveform. Um, okay, just, a uh, quick case, 50-year-old um, male with history of IV drug use, presence with altered mentation. Um, you can see he's febrile, he's tachycardic, and his blood pressure is by 100 by 40. Uh, pertinent findings on exam, he's diaphoretic, bounding pulse, murmur on exam, and track marks on his skin. So what valve would you think is involved? Hint is the pulse pressure from A line. Yay, yeah. So this is AR. Um, so why do we see this? So in AR, you initially see a very steep upstroke, and you can see the angle here. The angle shifted toward the right because there's a steep upstroke as um, the, um, the pressure from early contraction is transmitted directly to the aorta. And then there's a steep systolic decline because the pressure will drop rapidly um, and blood regurgitation into the, because of the blood regurgitation into LV as it fills in diastole. And there's a wide pulse pressure that we see in air. And as opposed to AS, where you can again see the angle is, there's a, the ventricle is contracting, but the blood flow is not as robust. So you don't see um, a steep systolic upstroke, um, the arterial pressure waveform basically rises slowly and the ventricle <coughs> struggles to squeeze the blood through a stenosis aortic valve, so it becomes less steep. And the dichrotic notch may not be discernible in this. Okay, so we use the arterial line now to give us values of cardiac output. We use devices to help give us that information and for a device to be able to do that, they should meet these three criteria. They should be able to analyze the geometry of the arterial pressure curve, especially in the, the systolic portion. They should be able to estimate the arterial compliance while accounting for the arterial tone. 
and estimate the aortic pressure from the peripheral pulse pressure. And this speaks to the distal amplification that we had talked about. So they should be able to account for that difference in between the peripheral arterial and aortic blood pressure. These devices can be calibrated or uncalibrated. The calibrated devices are the ones that have um, estimate, they estimate cardiac output from arterial pressure curve by an external calibration of the cardiac index. And this, the external calibration is done by transpulmonary thermodilution. What we typically use, um, and this is one of the reasons I want to talk about is because we use FlowTrack or Vigileo very commonly in our ICU. And this is one of the uncalibrated devices which continuously estimates arterial compliance, tone, pulse, and, um, and wave amplification. So in general, the calibrated devices are more accurate immediately following the calibration, but their accuracy degrades over time. It is really not clear if uncalibrated devices change their accuracy over time or not, but we're gonna talk about some limitations of Vigileo. I focused only on Vigileo just because this is what we use in our ICU and I thought, you know, I'm, I'm more familiar with this, so I thought it'd be a good step to understand this. Um, so it, it basically essentially works in the same uh, equation. Cardiac output is equal to heart rate into stroke volume. Heart rate is how it does the heart rate component is it measures the pulse rate and beats identified from the upslope of the waveform. And the pulse rate is com computed from time period of the beat. And how does it calculate the stroke volume? The stroke volume is calculated by multiplying the standard deviation of arterial pressure um, by a signal against this constant. Um, and I can go over the details of the constant, but it, it takes into account a lot of things. It basically uh, it incorporates standard deviation of mean, the, the skewness of the arterial waveform, wave the large vessel compliance. So it, this is a constant that the I think Edward Science should come up with. Um, the dynamic changes are estimated by the data and the waveform analysis. And we, it throws out numbers after computing all this. So how reliable are these uncalibrated devices? It's still debated in the literature. Um, basically the question, the biggest question is the validity of the technique when arterial tone changes to a large extent, which is mostly in sepsis, where our arterial tone is changing. So there were studies done for looking at the third generation devices to see how reliable they were with therapeutic measures like volume expansion and norepinephrine use. Um, these two studies both looked at the third generation devices and they said that, that it poorly tracked the trend in cardiac indices. So in other words, if you put a Vigileo on, you get initial numbers, you do your volume resuscitation, and you try to trend those numbers, are those numbers reliable or not? And what these studies say is that you can't 100% rely on their, um, what they're telling you. You have to take it, you can take the initial numbers, but don't rely heavily on the subsequent numbers to um, guide your therapy. Then they looked at the fourth generation flow track that came because they were trying to um, modify the third generation to see if they could help in, increase this um, track, tracking. Uh, but unfortunately, the fourth generation also in this study showed um, the card that it lacks the accuracy and trending ability in cardiac surgery and the discrepancy in cardiac output measurement depends on peripheral vascular tone. And this was done in cardiac surgery. So this was not even done in our ICUs, septic shock patients. So these are, this was a much more controlled setting than what we actually see in the ICU. So when not to use Vigileos, um, when there's arrhythmias which may affect the accuracy, um, severe persistent peripheral vasoconstriction or arterial spasm as in shock state. This is from Edward Life Science, by the way. So um, they themselves say that this may dampen your arterial waveform um, resulting in er erroneous cardiac output values. And this, it is unreliable in severe pulmonary hypertension. And I would probably add another one that is unreliable in patients with any 
any type of RV systolic failure. So it doesn't have to be systolic. just PHA, yeah, RV systolic so failure. Particularly right. liver failure patients that have RV dysfunction. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. So, um, coming to clinical uses, one, we use the arterial, we can use the A line to atta attach a vigileo and get some cardiac output numbers and SPV numbers, which I'm going to talk about next. But for fluid analysis, for, for fluid responsiveness, what are the two parameters that we have been looking at lately? So, we are looking at the pulse pressure variation and the stroke volume variation. Pulse pressure variation is the difference between systolic and diastolic arterial pressure um, that it, because it varies with respiration and it can be induced with, it is induced with positive pressure ventilation. Variation in pulse pressure is thought to be an indicator of patient's position on the Frank Starling curve, which indicates response to preload. And studies have demonstrated a, that a positive pressure ventilation uh, pulse pressure variation of at least 13 to 15% is strongly associated with volume responsiveness. Stroke volume variation is, I have this over here. Again, I, I, I like these images from Edward Lifestyle, so I just took it up to explain it better. Um, when used with controlled mechanical ventilation, stroke volume variation is a reliable indicator of preload responsiveness. When inflation from a positive pressure breath in a hypo, when, when we, the lungs inflate and the patients are hypovolemic, you basically cause compression of, an, of IVC, SVC, decrease the preload, decrease the cardiac output. Um, the same happens in expiration in hypovolemic patients. But once they're euvolemic, that positive pressure breath usually does not cause that narrowing of IVC and SVC does not affect our preload, so you don't have um, that much of stroke variation. And you can see the stroke vari uh, variation in the waveforms over here. And if you do attach a vigileo and look at the numbers, um, you can see SPV less than 10 usually indicates that patient would not benefit from additional fluid administration, whereas a high SPV would uh, indicate that the patients are still preload dependent and may benefit from fluid administration. So the interpretation again is limited with arrhythmias in a spontaneous breathing patient. If a patient has increased abdominal pressure or in an open thorax, we can't really use um, these numbers over there. The other, so this slide actually I added this morning on request of neuro ICU team who are rounding here. So if Dr. Ramadan is listening, this is for you. <laughs> so, um, so passive leg raising test. This test can be used as a pseudo fluid challenge um, of 150 to 300 ml by placing patients head down flat and a feet up to 45 degree angle, allowing blood to translocate into the central circulation and it adds to the preload. If there is a greater than 10, which is this example is showing that there is a greater than 10% increase in stroke volume or cardiac output, um, this could indicate fluid responsiveness. So the way it has been used is that patients have, um, we do this test, you get a cardiac output or stroke volume, you give a fluid bolus, um, um, you keep doing the test till you don't see the stroke vary, the variation and then you know that the your patient is fluid replete. How it helps is because you don't keep giving fluid challenges to patients, you basically um, mobilize their own volume, so it, it, it can be a better test. And in 2016, um, the syst systematic review was um, published. It included 23 studies, 1,000 patients, 1,000 fluid challenges, and demonstrated a pool sensitivity of 86% and a specificity of 92%. Uh, it accounted for the mode of ventilation, type of fluid used, passive leg raising, starting position, and measurement techniques that did not affect diagnostic performance. Um, it did say that the use of changes in pulse pressure on passive leg raising showed a lower diagnostic performance when compared with um, passive leg raising changes in flow variables like cardiac output. So cardiac output was not very uh, reliable indicator. Stroke volume was considered better. 
coming to pulmonary artery catheter. So this was first conceived by Dr. Jeremy Swan. This is the original NEJM publication in 1970, and this is um, Dr. William Gans and Dr. Swan. So indications of PA catheter. This is where we are most commonly using it when there's undifferentiated shock, severe pulmonary hypertension to guide therapy, um, acute myocardial infarction, which is complicated by se severe heart failure or mechanical complications. This is still debated now whether this is in severe left ventricular failure. It's not used all the time now. It's not recommended. In cardiac tamponade, you could use it. We know that this has been highly debate, debated whether it, if there is a use of PA catheter in ARDS. So I, uh, I've been reading the ICU Marino book and I really loved this. And Avi knows this because I've shared it with him, this, um, co the controversy. So why in 1970s, there was like, once the PA catheter had come out, every intensivist, every ICU was using it to guide treatment. But then there were studies done to see if um, this actually had any benefit. The ESCAPE trial was a randomized controlled trial of 433 patients from 2000 to 2003. Um, patients were assigned to receive therapy guided by clinical assessment and um, pulmonary artery catheter or clinical assessment alone. The addition of pulmonary artery catheter to careful clinical assessment increased anticipated adverse events, but did not affect overall mortality and hospitalization. Um, this study that was published in 2006 showed that pulmonary artery catheter guided therapy did not improve survival or organ function, but was associated with more complications than uh, central venous axis guided therapy. So, um, I'm going to read out these few points, and it's just for things to remember. I'm not making a for or against argument over here. Um, so, <laughs> PA catheter is a monitoring device. It's not a therapy. So, if a PA catheter is placed to evaluate a problem and it uncovers a disorder that is untreatable, the problem is not the catheter, but the lack of effective therapy. So, clinical outcomes should be used to evaluate therapies and not measurements. Surveys indicate that physicians often don't understand the measurements provided by the PA catheter, and that's one of the reasons it fails, because it's um, an understanding issue. Use of mortality rates to evaluate critical care interventions is problematic because the presumption that every intervention has to save lives to be of value is flawed. Interventions should have more specific and immediate goals other than life or death. In case of a monitoring device, the goal is to provide clinical information and the PA catheter achieves this goal with distinction. Just a thought. So the reality is we have invasive diagnostic tools available to give us hemodynamic, less invasive diagnostic tools available. Fellows and residents do not get much training to place pulmonary artery catheters. So we are less comfortable, the next generation of uh, residents and fellows, including me, we are less comfortable with placement and interpretation of waveforms because we just don't see as much. Uh, but there remains a core of accurate and reliable hemodynamic information not readily available from any other single device which can be obtained from a pulmonary artery catheter. So this is a standard pulmonary artery catheter, 110 centimeters long, 7 to 8 French in diameter. This is the air fill syringe that is used to inflate the balloon at the catheter tip, which is indicated by that arrow. Um, an accessory infusion port that connects to the lumen 30 centimeters from the catheter tip. Distal port, sorry, this is the 30 centimeters from catheter tip. Um, distal port that connects to a lumen at a catheter tip, which is used to measure pressures during cardiac catheterization, cardiac catheter insertion an approximal port that connects to an additional lumen 30 centimeters from the catheter tip and is used to monitor the right atrial pressure once the catheter tip is in pulmonary artery. This is the thermistor, thermistor wire extends from the catheter tip to electronic connector and this basically gives us our waveforms. Um, and this 
and actually this is the one that's used for thermodilution. So each thin dash represents a 10 centimeter and a thick dash represents a 50 centimeter mark and it's a 110 centimeter long catheter. So when do we absolutely not place a PA catheter? Absolute contraindication is right-sided endocarditis, tumors, mass, um, tumors or mass masses and severe pulmonary hypertension to guide therapy. And that's more because of a technicality issue because the catheter may dislodge. Um, relative contraindications are severe coagulopathy and thrombocytopenia. And it should be placed cautiously in patients who have left bundle branch block because there's a chance that we could um, create a complete heart block. And in patients with TR, which actually makes the catheter placement itself difficult. Um, the procedure, we, uh, we get the introducer sheet inserted via Seldinga technique. The distal port of the pulmonary artery catheter is connected to the main pressure monitor. Uh, before we start the insertion, the catheter is oriented to the curvature of the path that's expected. And once the tip is noted in SVC RA, we inflate the balloon, which should be approximately 15 centimeter. So what's the concept? The concept is when inflated, this balloon allows the flow of venous blood to carry the catheter through the right side of the heart into the main pulmonary artery. So basically, the blood just guides the catheter. Um, the distance to R is typically 15 to 20 centimeters from an IJ or um, subclavian and about 40 to 50 centimeters from a femoral vein. So once the catheter reaches around here, you should start seeing this waveform up here on the monitor. And this consists of your A, C, X, B, Y. Um, A is the atrial contraction, C is the tricuspid valve closure, X is the atrial diastole, and Y is the atrial emptying. So you should be able to see the components um, before you proceed any further. I've also put some normal pressure ranges, which we'll talk about um, We'll do some cases at the end, but in SVC RA, your normal mean pressure should be one to five millimeter mercury. The catheter is then advanced five to 10 centimeters until a right ventricular pre pressure waveform is increased. So it, when it's right about here, this um, is the waveform we should start seeing. Normal range is about systolic pressure should be 15 to 30 and diastolic should be about one to seven. Advance another five to 10 centimeters until the PA pressure waveform is transfused. So this is when the catheter goes from here, 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 all the way up until here. And we should start seeing the waveform appear on the monitor at that time. The PA pressure is systolic 15 to 30, uh, diastolic four to 12, but mean is what uh, we look at is nine to 19. The catheter is advanced until the waveform indi indicating pulmonary capillary wedge pressure is transduced. So this is your uh, wedge pressure waveform that should start coming on the screen at that time. This waveform is similar to the right atrial waveform, except that the great, greater variation may be noted with respiration in this waveform. So putting it all together, this would be the right atrium right ventricle, pulmonary artery, and pulmonary capillary wedge. And sometimes you go very quickly, sometimes you go very quickly from right atrium to pulmonary artery. If the pressure is high, you, you may not, you may have a very small glimpse of the right ventricular waveform. Always get a chest x-ray after we put a PA catheter, you want to make sure that it's in the right position. This is a chest x-ray that's showing uh, the PA catheter is appropriately placed in the right pulmonary artery, and this is an incorrectly placed catheter because the tip is lying in the right ventricle. Okay, so how do we do uh, cardiac output measurements from a PA catheter? So this is called the thermodilution method. We basically inject a dextrososaline solution that is colder than blood through the proximal port of the catheter PA. The cold fluid then mixes with the blood in the right heart chamber. The cool blood is ejected into the pulmonary artery. It goes from here to here and flows past the thermistor at the distal end of the catheter. The thermistor then records the change in blood temperature with time and the area under the curve is inversely proportional to the flow rate 
in the pulmonary artery, which is equivalent to the cardiac output in the absence of intracardiac shunt. And this is why PA catheters can actually be used to detect shunts because of the changes in oxygenation and changes in temperature. So inject cold water, it really depends upon the rate of flow, will tell you what your cardiac output is basically. So what is the principle of obtaining wedge pressure? Um, here's your balloon that's inflated. So when the balloon is inflated, um, it obstructs the flow. So your flow is zero. There's a static column between the tip of the catheter and left atrium. So the wedge pressure at the tip of the catheter is equivalent when there's a static column to the pulmonary capillary pressure and the pressure in the left atrium. So this pressure is all equal. So if, there's, if the mitral valve is normal, then your pulmonary capillary wedge pressure is actually equal to your left ventricle end diastolic pressure. And that's why this number is important for us. So having read that, what do we think could cause a high wedge pressure? Uh, let's say we put the catheter in, we have that static column, we're thinking this pressure should be all equalized. So when this goes high, it's because of, you want to show that? Yeah, yeah. Yes. So mitral aortic valve disease, left ventricular dysfunction, um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, when there's increased volume, when there's left to right shunts, or when there's cardiac tamponade or restrictive cardiomyopathy. So that would drive up our wedge pressure. Just try to think of it the way it reflects your left ventricle and diastolic pressure. And a low wedge pressure, hypovolemia, hemorrhage, um, severe intravascular volume depression, pulmonary venoclusive diseases, obstructive shock due to large PE could do it. So these are all the measurements we can get from a PA catheter. Direct measurements are something that we can see, like central venous pressure, the right atrial pressure, the right ventricular pressure, the PA pressure, wedge pressure. Cardiac output is kind of calculated. We can't just see that. Um, and the mixed venous oxygen hemoglobin, this, which we can get. These are all direct. And then there are these indirect measures that we can calculate out of the measures that we get over here. So what are the indirect um, measurements? So cardiac output, we talked about it. Uh, we can use the thermodilution method or we can use the FIC calculator to get the cardiac output. Cardiac index is cardiac output divided by the body surface area. Systemic vascular resistance, which is key in interpretation of our shock physiologies, is MAP minus right atrial pressure divided by cardiac output multiplied by 80. And I have a couple of cases where we can show you these calculations. Um, pulmonary vascular resistance is pulmonary artery pressure divided by the wedge pressure minus the wedge pressure divided by the cardiac output multiplied by 80. And these are the normal numbers to uh, remember. And for SVR, it's interesting to see the range is wide. It's 700 to 1600. Um, and SVR plays an important role in us trying to diagnose shock. So interpreting numbers, and I'm, we're on the last few slides. So scenario one, this patient is presenting with hypotension and hypoxia. Let's assume we quickly place a PA catheter. And <laughs> the map is 55. So the right atrial pressure is eight, so it's slightly up. Right ventricular systolic pressure is 40, so it's slightly up. Mean pulmonary artery pressure is high, it's 26. And your wedge is five, which is low, and your cardiac output is low. And I actually, I made up these numbers, but I calculated the SVR based on these numbers, and the SVR calculated is 1,000. So can you think of a physiology that would do this? That would, it, it would raise your right atrial, right ventricular pressures, reduce your cardiac output, the patient's hypotensive, but your wedge is normal, your pulmonary pressures are up. Yeah. So PE, okay. Scenario two, patient's hypotensive, hypoxic with fever, 
of course it had to be a fever. Uh, <laughs> um, MAP is 55, again, RA is 1, RVSP is 12, pulmonary artery pressure is 12, VEG is 5, again, cardiac output is low. And this is your calculated SVR. What could this represent? So low filling pressures, high systemic vascular resistance, low cardiac output. Hypovolemia, sepsis, septic shock. Okay. Cardiac output is low. So this is early. Yeah. These numbers are exaggerated. Um, patient with hypotension, shortness of breath, and a chest pain. Um, MAPS again, 55. RA, RVDP, mean pulmonary artery pressure, wedge pressure, they're all high. And your cardiac output is low. I heard it. Tamponade, yeah. So equalization of, I just wanted to show the concept of equalization of pressures with tamponade. See all the useful information we're getting from a PA catheter right now? <laughs> <laughs> So we know. Um, hypertension, shortness of breath, and chest pain. Same scenario, same map. Your aerial pressure now is equivocal. Your right ventricular systolic pressure is high. Mean pulmonary artery pressure is on the higher side. Your wedge is now 20, and your cardiac output is still low. cardiogenic shock. So I just wanted to give examples of, yes, we talk about PA catheters and A lines and everything, but what does that actually mean for us? Um, and I know we have echoes now and ultrasounds and we've had that debate about where, <laughs> where this can, you know, when is the right time to think of a PA catheter? Um, and I think I'm sure Dr. Rivers will have something to say about it at the end. <laughs> but, um, so my take home points are invasive hemodynamic monitoring can provide valuable information to guide resuscitative efforts. And these are just some things we went over today. However, data should only be used in conjunction with proper history and physical exam to make accurate inferences of what this data represents. Um, and each monitoring device and technique has its own set of limitations, which should be kept in mind when using these devices and extracting numbers out of it. And, key point is that Vigileo that we use so much. Um, and it's a very useful um, device, but I think we just need to keep in mind its limitations and how we can interpret the data from it. Thank you. Yeah, Dr. Cohen. Um, good question. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know the answer. Uh, Dr. Rivers. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So, correct. Right, like so when you study like specific, uh, like SVV, if you look just at the, how SVV was designed and studied or how PPV was designed and studied, they, they obviously look at cardiac output and they look at um, stroke volume. And I agree with you, the initial data for all this, for cardiac output, for stroke volume, everything came from PA capital. So basically every other studies they're on have actually built on the initial 
But the point to try to make, with, which we, is a debate in our community is, can we get the same data from a less invasive modality? So like, can we just estimate cardiac output from an echo rather than putting a PA catheter in? That's where the big, big debate about inserting or not inserting. I don't think people debate the information that you get from PA catheter is valuable. What people debate about is whether the risk benefit, whether you can derive the same information from a less invasive modality. And I don't know if um, we will have a resolution to that. Yes. Except for the oxygen step up. Yeah. And that's why the application is great. Thank you. 
Thank you. And I think one other thing, and again, not, not to be flippant about the ACT and the requirements, but the, the reason why they have moved away from the requirements of knowledge uh, or the ability, the skill of placing it is because, again, we all think that the value really is understanding the interpretation of what gay capitalists and all of these other things are going on to provide some figures which is why that is clearly stated as a program requirement. And I think, you know, there, there are a couple of things for us to always remember when we think about PA capitalists too, is that they in and of themselves have assumptions as well. The most common one is that we assume we know what the, L, the, the, the LV volume is based on a pressure measurement of the wedge. So we make all kinds of assumptions about filling volumes based on pressure measurements, and they are not equivalent. So even with a PA catheter, there are certain limitations and certain assumptions we have to make because there are some measurements that we cannot directly make, particularly volume measurements. And I think that often, you know, gets lost in the conversation as well. But I think this is, this again is a prime example where understanding the physiology rescues you every time. And if you understand those fundamental elements of cardiac output and stroke volume and heart rate and all of these other things in terms of oxygen delivery, if you always go back to that foundational knowledge, that will help you interpret all of these other hemodynamic parameters that may not be as clear cut as, as we want them to be. I think that's the clear take home message. And so, you know, um, going back and continuing to review this kind of information helps you when you're trying to apply it at the bedside. Because I think we all recognize that it's never this clear cut when we actually have the patient in front of us. And, and that's something to keep in mind. You know, even when you think about a vigileo and you're talking about pulse pressure variation, well, most people would argue if you have a wide pulse pressure, guess what? You're probably under resuscitated, you're probably yeah. volume deplete. And so you don't need a big fancy measurement calculation to clue you in on that because you know that from the physiologic state of the patient. And so always going back to that will, will help you kind of tease out these gray areas um, mm -hmm. and you know provide the management that the patients you know need to. Thank you. How do we check if this question is on the Yeah, yeah. yeah in, when we did the cardiology fellows placed two or three and eight. <laughs> so they, they were busy. You know. We really spend the time of sitting yeah. down with the PA capital placement right. and going over it over and over and over again. Yeah. You know, talking to our, our critical care staff, our school staff, our cardiology staff, and really kind of keeping that in the back of mind because it's incredibly important. Because one, you never know which patients you may have with a PA catheter, so you need to know what to do with the information. That's why, you know, that whole controversy around PA catheters is worn out is because it's not that they're inherently unsafe, it's that no one knows what to do with the, with the tracing once they get Thank you. Now you tell me. I said, now you tell me. <laughs> <laughs>